Hi, everybody, and, and welcome here to the uh, fourth event in our 2022 Animal Law Week at Harvard Law School. Uh, my name is Chris Green. I'm the executive director of the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program here. Um, we've got a wonderful program today on opportunities in the plant-based economy. Um, we've got two wonderful people who will be sort of interviewing each other and having more of a, a conversation. Um, the first is Max Bazerman. He's the Jesse Isidore Strauss Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School and the co-director of the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard Kennedy School. He's the author, co-author, or co-editor of 20 books, including 2020's The Power of Experiments, Decision-Making in a Data-Driven World, uh, and also over 200 research articles and chapters, most recently publishing A New Model for Ethical Leadership in Harvard Business Review. His awards include an honorary doctorate from the University of London Business School and both the Distinguished Educa Educator Award and Distinguished Scholar Award from the Academy of Management. Max's, Max's external work involves teaching and consulting in over 30 countries. Joining us remotely by Zoom, we have Parish Patel. He's the President, Chief Executive Officer and Director of the Natural Order Acquisition Company. Uh, Patrice is, uh, is also a director and he's managed his own private investment office, Sandstone Investments, since 2014. From 2005 to 2014, Parish was the founder and managing partner of Sandstone Capital, an investment fund managing more than a billion dollars and focused on long-term investments in public and private companies in Asia. Sandstone invests in a wide range of industries with a focus on pharmaceuticals, financial services, and technology. From 2000 to 2004, Parish was the founder of Sparta Group, a multi-billion dollar family office. Parish's most notable private investments include Barat Financial IPO in 2010, uh, a123 Systems IPO in 2009, Tejas Networks in 2004, and uh, ReliCore uh, acquired by Symantec in 2016. Preach um, served on the board of several public and private businesses in the US and India. Uh, he's also served as a director for Harvard Business School India and was an executive producer of the 2018 documentary film, The Game Changers, which we've shown here at Harvard Law School, that advocates for the health benefits of a plant-based diet for high-performance athletes as well as for the general population. Parish received an MBA from the Harvard Business School and a BA from Boston College. So without further ado, I will hand it over to them to uh, have a lovely conversation. Okay. Um, another minute on, on me. Um, about four years ago, I was um, invited to be interviewed about behavioral ethics at an um, effective altruism conference over at MIT. And I arrived uh, kind of an hour before my talk. And the speaker before me, was uh, Bruce Friedrich from the Good Food Institute, who some of you might know about. And um, he gave a talk on basically the plant-based economy. Um, and at the time I was a vegetarian and that talk kind of changed the last four years of my life significantly. So in those four years, um, I went from vegetarian to vegan, but I also started connecting to the world of people who are investing in um, the next generation of food. Make sure your mic's on. I will. It says it's on. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, I, let's move, let's move it a little bit. Sorry. Okay. Um, so um, I, I heard this talk by Bruce Friedrich. I it kind of got me involved in the world of plant-based investing. Um, and about a year and a half ago, um, Paresh and his uh, partner, um, Sebastiano Castro Castigliano, started a SPAC, which we may get to the details of what a SPAC is, but it's a corporation and I was invited to be on the board. And so um, Paresh became kind of my regular new Zoom friend on a uh, ongoing basis for the last year and a half. And then in January, we jointly taught a course with SEBA um, on the plant-based economy um, at the Harvard Business School for four days. And we're kind of going to take that, those four days and reduce them, uh, reduce the four days to about 40 minutes um, to give you some overview of what this world looks like. Um, so Parish, um, welcome. And I want to Get, learn a little bit more from you. I'm going to learn, uh, speak this way so that I'm talking to the to everybody, even though I, I can't see Parish when I do that. Um, Parish, tell us a little bit about your journey, because when we look at your background, you look like an HBS investment guy, very successful, and now you we find you spend most of your time on the plant-based economy. 
Can you tell us how you got to being a central figure in the plant-based world? Uh, thanks, Max. And uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, I see Kristen there and uh, thank you, Chris, uh, uh, for inviting us. Um, uh, sorry, I couldn't be there in person. We have two people at home uh, with COVID and so, uh, uh, not me, uh, but I uh, thought out of uh, caution uh, uh, coming uh, via Zoom. Uh, so, so my uh, uh, my um, actually journey uh, to plant based is is actually driven mostly by my wife Nirva, who is actually part of the animal law program there at uh, Harvard Law School. Uh, she's a very passionate uh, advocate for animal rights um, uh, and for animal welfare, and so. Uh, when we got married, I wasn't a, a vegetarian. Um, uh, I would say I was um, not a, a big carnivore, but I, I certainly did eat uh, did eat meat, and I wasn't really all that conscious about the impact of of um, uh, of being non vegetarian on, on myself, on animals, on, and on the, on the planet. And so, really, through our our marriage and, and our sort of partnership and uh, discussing how do we want to raise our kids and what are the values we want to give them. I really began to think more about the consequences of my own choices. Uh, and in my journey, uh, I think on this path started probably about five or six years ago. So about halfway, uh, about maybe uh, two thirds, about halfway into our marriage, I suppose. And um, uh, since then, uh, I've really uh, turned my attention to, well, what can I do with my skill set and what I've learned in, in the capital that we, we can sort of bring to the table? To, see, to bring about a change. And, and I think um, uh, when I left uh, HBS in, in 2000, I, I went straight into the investment business. And um, uh, what's interesting is I've always done uh, investments um, um, uh, in every step along the way that had some element of um, uh, a public good. Uh, so um, uh, I invested in the, the first, uh, in the largest microfinance company in the world, um, uh, that ever went public. Uh, we took them public back in, uh, I think, 2010. Uh, we invested in the first hybrid electric vehicle battery company that ever went public. Um, uh, we did uh, a number of movies uh, prior to the Game Changers just uh, on topics that we thought were interesting to us. And so I, I think I've always been attracted to, to something that uh, can do good for the world, not just finance. And, um, uh, and just given where we are today in terms of the food system, this is an area where I really enjoy spending a lot of my time. So uh, I guess that would be uh, my journey, so to speak. I hear Nerva played a big role in is part of your answer. So I, my next question was gonna ask, ask you, what, what's your motivation? Is it animal suffering, the environment, feeding the world's population, efficient use of resources, um, antibiotic resistance, um, or, or maybe another category that we might throw in is marital happiness. Um, <laughs> Can you? <laughs> what, we started what are, off with marital happiness. I think that's sort of the, uh, you know, everyone goes into marriage with a couple of things that they're absolutely indisputable. And indisputable in our house was that our kids were never going to eat meat and were never going to eat eggs. And uh, I think I'm very happy that we've been successful in that. Um, uh, although I, I might have been sort of brought around that path. Uh, I'd love to ask you that same question, uh, Max. Uh, so maybe once I answer, I'll, I'll bring it back to you. But I think. Uh, first and foremost, I think it is about animal welfare and, and understanding that uh, uh, the sentience of all living things and, um, and and the more that we can do to sort of eliminate animals from our own consumption, whether it be what we eat or, or what we wear or, or what we draw or, or um, uh, how we sort of um, uh, uh, sort of bring them into our house or in our cars. I think that to me is, is number one. Um, I do think that uh, there's so many other issues from uh, from animal consumption in terms of the impact on the world, the environment, uh, um, uh, of feeding the world. It's inevitable. You know, I, I, there's no way to feed um, uh, uh, the globe uh, with the increasing level of demand for protein and higher incomes by just relying on animals. So, so, so I think you know it's starting really with uh, the welfare, but it comes to a certain inevitability. So. so. I don't know about you, Max. What, what, what do you think? What, what uh, you so I, I followed my spouse into vegetarianism about 30 years ago. And then I saw the Bruce Friedrich talk four years ago and started transitioning myself. And, and my spouse has now followed me into veganism. And, and, and I would say that it's sort of animal suffering certainly comes first for, um, for both of us. 
Um, but, but I find that people enter this world for one reason and often adopt the other reasons that are interconnected. So let's, uh, um, I'm gonna transition us up Rish, um, to, to products. And to can, just... I, can I add one thing to that, uh, uh, Max, if you don't mind? Um, so, so someone who's sort of relatively new compared to many people, certainly in the room uh, uh, to, to, to alternative protein, I think people come with different motivations and uh, you know, the people that are the most passionate um, and maybe a, a, a little bit, um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, as I should say, uh, uh, you know, maybe sometimes overly passionate come from the animal welfare side. And, and I think um, there are often a lot of microaggressions like, you know, well, are you vegan? Are you not vegan? How long have you vegan? Have you ever had meat? Um, um, oh, you are, you still eat cheese or, um, oh, you still eat fish. And, uh, and I think these are unhealthy topics, uh, uh, so to speak. I think anyone who's sort of willing to sort of change their consumption pattern and reduce uh, and help uh, animals reduce their suffering and also impact uh, the planet, I think are welcome. Uh, and so I would encourage anyone in the audience who isn't fully vegan, not to be turned off by the microaggressions that sometimes are there in the space, because I don't think those microaggressions are healthy. I, I think anyone who's willing to change is welcome and I certainly feel that way, so. Thank you, Bryce. If, if I provided a microaggression, I apologize. That certainly wouldn't be my intent because I agree completely with what you're saying. Um, my most recently published book was called Better Not Perfect, having exactly that theme. Um, we, we, it's hard to be perfect in this world, but being better than we were last year is actually relatively easy. And if we get a, ourselves on a path to doing better, I think that that's a very useful path. Okay, but so far we've been talking about um, the world of um, animal rights and, uh, and, and food more broadly. Let's talk a little bit about the products that are out there that you might be investing in. Um, and to help orient us, Prish, can you um, give us a, a clarity over three different categories of products? So we hear plant-based, we hear cell-based or, or, or cultivated, and more recently, we've been hearing fermented um, products. Can you clarify what, what people are talking about when they use the term plant-based, cell-based, and fer fermented? Sure, uh, I'd be happy to. And by the way, you know, just so the audience knows, Max is as much or more of an expert on all these topics as I am. So um, as the professor, he gets to ask the question and I, and I sort of, I'm supposed to uh, give the answer. So. Whenever you want to jump in, Max, and please go ahead. So, 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 so when people talk about plant-based fermentation and cell-based, they're talking about production methods. Um, and then, uh, so I would say, you know, if you want to put those on one axis, the other axis are the types of food. So you would have beef, you would have eggs, you would have um, chicken, you would have seafood, you would have ingredients. Uh, so you would have like uh, gelatin uh, sub, uh, uh, replacements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, as well as protein powders. And so uh, uh, people use these different technologies for different purposes. Uh, Plant-based is the easiest technology by which to create alternative protein. And, and the core plant-based companies that you would have heard of are uh, gonna be companies like uh, uh, Just Egg um, with their egg replacement product. Um, it's gonna be um, uh, Impossible Foods, it's gonna be um, Oatly, it's going to be beyond. Uh, the, they're all using uh, plant-based um, uh, uh, ingredients. And, and typically, it's going to be coming from, uh, historically, it's soy, pea protein, um, and um, uh, soy protein, pea protein. Uh, and then um, uh, sometimes people use rice and almond and, and those sorts of things. But they don't typically really have a real protein element. And oat obviously is very common in milk. Yeah. Uh, so so plant-based is really what uh, people like to call generation one. Uh, these are the products that are the most quickly uh, able to be produced in a food lab. And then once you add the aromas and the additional flavors through uh, sort of chemical technologies, um, then you figure out how do you bake and how do you cook and how do you uh, slice and bread it such that it, it, re it replicates meat. Um, uh, fermentation um, is sort of generation two. Um, although fermentation has been around much longer than plant-based. Uh, so the vast majority of cheeses that you would eat, the industrial cheeses, so whether it's 
shredded in a bag or whether it's a block are all fermented cheeses. Uh, there, there really is no dairy component associated with it. And, and fermentation is the process by which you make beer, by the way, by the way you make wine and, um, and a lot of other sort of products as well. Uh, the classic fermentation that people use now is that they will identify a compound, they'll attach it to yeast, and then they will allow it to sort of propagate with the right feedstock within a large vat. Uh, and then what they would do is they would separate the yeast and the feedstock from the underlying protein that they're trying to generate. And then they would sell you that protein. So, this, so that's fermentation. Uh, cultured is not that different from fermentation uh, in the sense that, again, you're using um, uh, chemical feedstocks to take an underlying cell and then you're trying to grow it in a big vat. Uh, so a lot of people think cell-based, oh, you're going to grow an ear in a petri dish or you're going to grow a chicken thigh in a petri dish. That's not really what happens. What happens in, in cell bases, they use a fermentation type method, but they're actually replicating exact cells. So, so in fermentation, uh, you, might, you might not be uh, creating, in traditional fermentation, you're not creating an exact chicken breast. Um, but in cell base, you're actually trying to create the ingredients of a chicken breast. And then what you do is you take the underlying protein and you put it on what's called a scaffold. And it could be a plant-based scaffold. It could be a, 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 a entirely chemical scaffold. And they use that scaffold to then uh, um, uh, create um, a chicken breast, for example, that looks like chicken and feels like chicken um, uh, and smells like chicken because chemically, it's 100% uh, uh, identical uh, uh, to a chicken aside from the scaffold. So, so, so cell base gets closest to pure replication. Fermentation is you're growing one ingredient. Uh, plant base is trying to copy it. Uh, so three different types of technologies. So um, cell base is the farthest from really being at commercial scale. Fermentation, you already have products at commercial scale. Plant base is already uh, on the shelf. Uh, but you're not finding many, aside from the cheeses, fermented products uh, on the shelf uh, uh, today, but they're coming. Um, Thank you. So I hope there's more clarity I can get to that. Yeah. I thought that was a terrific overview of, of what the terrain looks like. Can you tell us a little bit more about your decision to invest in this world? Um, is this, as an investment guy, are you um, making a good investment? Or are you willing to sacrifice the quality of the investment in order to make it a more humane investment? How do you how do you think about that? Well, I think different people have different approaches. So, so there will be angel investors out there. My partner Saba is one who will invest in many, many companies, you know, 100 companies, 60 plus companies. And you can't really do 100 companies and expect all of them to be a success. So, uh, and so, you know, some of that is a calculus that, of course, some of them will fail. Some of that is, is, is Seba really trying to just support as many entrepreneurs as possible. Um, my approach is, is different. My approach is I'm only looking at companies that have the opportunity to be successful. Uh, and, and, um, and I'm going to be highly selective. And, and I believe in that because you can only really create um, a social good if those companies are successful on a standalone basis, great management, great products, great ability to generate profits. So, uh, and so um, uh, I'm really looking at it no different than I'm looking at any other investment, uh, which is, do you have an amazing management team that is both passionate, uh, have is a willing suspension of disbelief and has the ability to execute? Um, are they trying to solve a massive problem with something where they have a competitive edge? I think. Uh, early on, just having a plant-based product gave you an opportunity to be on the shelf and sell. That no longer is an opportunity. You have to have something unique that provides incrementality in terms of flavor, taste, uh, sensorial experience uh, if you're plant-based. Uh, if you're fermentation or cell-based, you need to have something that has a scientific advantage. Um, uh, so I'm gonna be adding that in sort of my uh, sort of mental calculus as to whether something's a good investment. Uh, and then the last is, is that what is your proof of success thus far? Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and that'll be um, plant-based is gonna be on the shelf and generating revenue, but fermentation and cell-based is gonna be how far along are you in the cost curve and, and in the sort of the food replica curve. Uh, so uh, like we're looking at a company today that's able to generate protein 
at a third of the cost of whey protein, but with greater nutrition and, and, and greater functionality, meaning better emulsion and, and other characteristics. Uh, uh, so something with that level of magnitude is something that can be successful. But if you're 10 or 20% cheaper, but you have a better social good story, I don't think that's going to work anymore. Do you want to tell us about some of your favorite companies out there, um, if you're um, able? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, as a consumer, you know, uh, I like Impossible quite a bit. I like Beyond. We use Just a lot. We use Notco at home. We use Oatly at home. Uh, these are all the consumer brands that sort of fit in our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, life. Um, uh, from an investment side, um, I guess it's a little complicated to talk in too much detail, but what I would say is that I believe in fermentation a lot more than culture. I believe that culture is still the domain of, of biotech and in the private company space, and there will be some successful companies there. Um, uh, if I am thinking about joining one as a law school student, uh, I would join one either on the business side or legal side that is sufficiently down the curve, cost curve where you can see the products, you might be able to sample the products uh, and um, uh, they have manufacturing uh, facilities. Uh, I, I think that's, that's where I would go. I don't know about you, Max, do, do you have certain companies that you think um, uh, are more interesting to you than others? So. Yeah, so prior to this, um, uh, prior to being part of this uh, um, sort of plant-based investing world, um, I was a really boring person who put my money in Vanguard index funds and forgot about it. Um, and my life was very simple. And then I, I focused on, on, on my day job, not, not thinking about investing. Um, and I, and I, I honestly don't have a lot of confidence in my ability to pick companies, um, but I think I can pick people. Um, so I tend, to, I tend to focus more um, on the quality of the management team. Um, rather than trusting my palate, because I'm simply one one consumer. So the fact, so I really like um, a company called Renegade. They make like a something between a pepperoni and salami kind of product out of seitan. I think it tastes just terrific. I think Plant Ranch tastes just just terrific. So there's, I can tell you what appeals to my palate, but I make my investment decisions more based on the people. And you know, I'm very impressed with. Um, um, with Kerry Song, who runs Abbott's Butcher. I'm very impressed with um, Lee Cooper, who runs Bard VQ. That's with a V instead of a B. Um, so I tend to focus on people. Um, but let's, um, um, I'm going to shift us a little bit for a to the people who are here with us today. Um, in January, we had the opportunity to spend four days primarily with MBA students, but now we have m more people who have law degrees or will soon have law degrees. Um, can you talk about what, two questions. One, what do you see as the opportunities for lawyers or people trained as lawyers in the plant-based economy? And if you were kind of a 26-year-old 2L um, sitting here, um, how might one think about whether the plant-based economy is a viable alternative to some of the other amazing legal careers that we've been hearing about over the last few days um, in terms of animal personhood and things like that. Um, if you have any insights, um, love to hear that. Yeah, I, I think um, <clears throat> uh, uh, maybe I won't talk too much about um, the nonprofit space uh, or, or the government space uh, where I think uh, there is a lot of opportunity. I think in um, in the for-profit company world, I think there 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 is quite a bit of opportunity in terms of uh, a multi-layer. So so one layer is specifically working on issues related to um, the success of the industry, meaning um, FDA applications, grass applications, generally regarded as safe. Um, uh, uh, working with the uh, the different regulatory bodies. Um, uh, as a company uh, to, to make sure that their products are approved and able to be sold wherever they want to be sold. And I think that um, uh, just about every uh, large company is going to need internal counsel to sort of manage that, um, uh, that pipeline, so corporate counsel. Uh, I think the, the other 
opportunity is not really specific to sort of the regulatory environment, but more um, uh, there's a lot of M&A that's about to happen in plant-based because there are a lot of companies that got started on passion, have shelf space, have a customer following, but aren't going to be able to scale. And so the larger companies like uh, Beyond and Impossible and, and Oatly are going to start buying these smaller companies and expand their footprint. Uh, uh, so, so being on the deal side, either working at one of these companies or working at an investment bank or, or working at a law firm, uh, I think there's going to be quite a bit of m and in the plant-based space for the next three or four years. So, uh, so, so I think uh, those are sort of more traditional legal paths. Uh, and of course, you know, if you got into Harvard Law School, that means you're really pretty, you know, you're very, very smart, smarter than business school students, uh, as we all like to say. So, so, so there are quite a number of law school um, people that I've seen that haven't really gone forward to practice law and entered the business world. Um, uh, and I think you, you would probably want an intermediate job first, working at a consulting firm or an investment bank um, to get that class of training. Uh, but then you could do that and sort of move on to plant-based space uh, from, from that perspective. But um, um, uh, I think there are many more ways on the nonprofit side than on the for-profit side. But, uh, and I think you could pursue a legal career and at the same time help animal equality or or help GFI or, or, or help one of these other organizations on a pro bono basis. So I, I think there's sort of multiple ways of doing that too. Great. Um, so one of the things that I've seen as a disturbing trend in the, literally the last few months has been, there have been a number of lawsuits between two different plant-based companies. Um, and they're primarily fighting over patent rights. Um, and uh, I'm kind of struck by the fact that we have here a group of lawyers or soon to be lawyers who are passionate about animals and these companies succeeding would be a good thing. Um, next building over, we have the program on negotiation, which is ideally helps people resolve disputes differently. Uh, is, is there a role for lawyers? to reduce the conflict of plant-based product against plant-based product violence, um, which can't be good for animals or the investors in the aggregate. Any sense of that? Well, it, it's interesting, Max. I'd love to get your opinion on that also. I think, you know, I think what you might be referring to is the lawsuit of Impossible Foods suing Motif. Uh, Motif um, co-developed with uh, Impossible the heme protein, which is sort of the essence of their food experience. Uh, um, uh, and that heme protein that they developed, I think, had a little bit of controversy because there was originally uh, an FBF-based uh, um, uh, technology, which they've since moved from. Uh, and when you look at Impossible Foods, uh, the founder, Pat Brown, there isn't a more passionate animal activist uh, uh, out there than Pat Brown, yet he had made two choices. One choice was he originally started the FBS, and then secondly, uh, he's decided to sue Motif uh, on the eve of what I think is their IPO next year um, or later on this year. And so I would say that it's unfortunate that it's come to that, but I would say that the people at Motif are not animal rights people. Uh, they haven't come uh, from any perspective whatsoever um, uh, uh, towards supporting animals. They were really more of a service firm, a Syn Bio firm, um, a subsidiary of Ginkgo Bioworks. Uh, so, so I wouldn't say it's plant-based versus plant-based, it's plant-based versus its vendor. Uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, Motif, uh, Motif's goal was to actually sell the heme protein to as many companies as possible. And, impo and Impossible feels that it was their IP that was being taken advantage of. So I don't blame Impossible for it. Um, I don't know what I would do as an investor. I think you sort of have to accept it. It's a little bit of an Apple versus, um, um, uh, I guess, a Windows sort of a, a phenomenon. Yeah. So, 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 I, that, so. so I think I've read about three different stories. So it was great to actually have you provide a, sort of a, a, some details of the motif um, impossible story, but I've actually read about some other um, similar lawsuits all having to do with patents um, and whether or not one firm is violating the other firm's patent. And it's also interesting for you to clarify impossible as sort of an important influence 
um, on the plant-based economy and motif has a very different profile. Um, and I'm not, I'm not even close to a lawyer. I'm not gonna become a lawyer. So I don't have any opinion on whether or not motif is in fact violating the patent um, of impossible. And I, and I don't think you should get your legal advice from me. Um, I, but I am also struck by the fact that um, impossible has, well, it's undoubtedly done tremendous good. Um, part of its um, positioning is that it's doing it for the animals, that, 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 that motives are pure. Uh, and, I, and I am struck by the fact that Impossible may not have done the, made the best choice in terms of not licensing or selling their patent for on him, which would, would in fact open up the opportunity for lots of other companies to create um, plant-based products um, that could help us as well. So I'm not arguing that they should be giving away their, 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 their uh, patented technology but I think if you wanted to create the most good, you have to raise the question, would we be better off if they chose to license that technology as well? Um, but I've been asking Parish a lot of questions, chiming in with my own opinions. Um, let's open it up to the folks in the room um, to do two things. One, ask questions, but also feel free to get up and go grab a whole pizza if you want, because I think we have plenty of pizza here because we have many more people who are online who can't have pizza than the people in the room. So um, let's start in the room, see if there's any questions, and then we'll go to Chris. And if you could just raise your hand, uh, I'll, we need you to ask the microphone, the question into the microphone. I see that there are two also in the chat in case we don't have any live currently. Yeah, there's one live. Chris is in charge of managing all the stuff that's online. Hello. Uh, I'm from biology department. Unlike business and the law, I'm not, in terms of finance, it's not that successful, but I'm a vegetarian for a religious reason as well as for the animal rights. But since I came from India, I just posed the question to the. Uh, so now, historically speaking, India was never vegan. And only during the king or emperor Ashoka time, most people were vegetarians. But that posed a big problem to India. After that, the soldiers, they lost the uh, practice of fighting and withstanding the foreign aggression. So there was so much invasion and India was never one country after Ashoka time. So do you expect the whole country to be of being vegetarians and be capable of protecting themselves? Chris, you want to get us started with that? Uh, sure. Well, I guess uh, there's a couple things. Uh, uh, one is, um, um, does meat give you an ability to be more aggressive in fight? It sounds like that's sort of an element to what you're saying. And then secondly, why should poor countries um, who were vegetarian, possibly partly because they couldn't really afford meat uh, um, uh, and cattle was too important for, for their livelihood, um, uh, for consumption, uh, why should they remain vegetarian? And I think, um, I think one way, I, the first question, I, maybe I'll, I'll pass for a second, but on the second question, what I'd say is that uh, food, in a sense, is, um, uh, is related to development. Uh, and so what you eat is based on what you can afford. Uh, in, in a way, it's no different than technology. And so, um, uh, one of my investments back in the day was uh, the largest uh, cell phone company in India. We, we sold uh, hundreds of millions of phones a year domestically. And what we ended up doing was skipping the entire um, keyboard generation. We took people straight from having no phone to going straight to having touch screens. Um, uh, and I think that uh, ultimately is what I think is what we're doing with the alternative protein, hopefully in India. Uh, not yet now because alternative protein is too expensive. But ultimately, I think that in India and in China and in parts of Africa and in parts of uh, other countries, uh, you'll be, have the ability to skip animal-based protein, go to a healthier, uh, a more nutritious and a higher, higher functional set of protein that'll be created through fermentation and other technologies. Uh, and, I think you, and I think they will be better off uh, uh, no different than uh, than the cell phone. Um, in terms of the, the the first part of your your question, uh, does 
meat make you more aggressive? Um, uh, I can say that I, I don't eat meat anymore and I'm just as aggressive as I used to be, uh, but now I do it for a real purpose. Uh, but, but one thing that we had in the movie with, with the Game Changers was really talking about your ability to be an effective athlete uh, and, and, and uh, the ability to transport oxygen uh, more effect effectively uh, from your heart to your muscles and, and back. Uh, and I think that um, that movie is a good answer to that uh, in terms of your ability to, uh, to be an athlete and, and be competitive. Uh, so I don't know, Max, if you, if you wanted to add anything. To that. I, I would simply add that the, the enormous multiple of protein that we have to feed the animal to get protein out of the animal, um, uh, we're talking 10 to 40 times as much protein going into animals. If we think about a, a developing country, um, how can it make sense that you want to encourage a model that's going to be so inefficient in the production of protein? Um, if you just kind of sort of started from scratch and say, we can move to this alternative model and here's what the data looks like, you would say this isn't a good deal. And so I think that there's a good reason for developing economies to want to encourage plant-based, uh, plant-based, broadly plant fermented, cellular based, because of the efficiency in addition to any concerns you might have for justice. I've got another, another question over here. And uh, I would just add that even if it were true, uh, probably having less military aggression wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing for our <laughs> world right now. Thank you for that add on. Uh, hi there, Ryan from Facilities, not a lawyer at all. Um, but you bring up this question on, you know, plant on plant litigation and, and its effect on us scaling up and, and selling more. Um, <coughs> and, and an equal or greater question is the dairy on plant litigation that's going on. Um, you know, Dairy Board, XYZ, whatever they're called, arguing over the definition of what is a milk, what is an egg what can be sold on what shelf, et cetera. Um, so if anybody wants to comment on that, be interested. I, I think I'm gonna cold call Chris on this because the animal law program has been shockingly involved in the labeling issue in some fundamental ways. Yeah, there's a, uh, especially with regards to cultivated technologies, uh, there's a, uh, we, our clinic had a petition, put for the petition drafted by one of our former students, Kelly McGill, who, uh, that really pushed once the, the FDA and USDA determined how they were going to split up the jurisdiction of these new products between the two of them. Um, USDA uh, Food Safety Inspection Service uh, oversees labeling. And once they were allocated that, our clinic sent off a petition saying, before you get too excited about this, we really want to remind you of some of your constitutional obligations so you don't do anything that's overly restrictive. Um, and, and, and then they just put out this advanced notice of proposed rulemaking where they are seeking public comment on exactly how those products should be labeled. Um, one good aspect of that is that a lot of states, uh, we've seen at the state level, dozens of laws introduced and several passed requiring plant-based and cultivated products to carry some really draconian labeling. So it's like saying it's lab grown or something like that. For example, Georgia has some really crazy laws regarding that. Fortunately, with regards to the cultivated products, many of those might be preempted uh, by the federal uh, federal rules when they come out. Um, plant-based, no, because the USDA does not have jurisdiction over plant-based products because they're not technically meat. Um, so it is, a, it is a very big problem at the state level. Um, there's some litigation and some of these aren't just <coughs> criminal penalties. So, um, you know, the, the, the head, the, that's why some of those lawsuits, the heads of Tofurky literally could be jailed for trying to sell their products in Missouri carrying certain labeling. So um, there's it's lots of ongoing litigation over that. Um, uh, but we are seeing some really positive moves from it on, on the federal reg regulatory front. Um, I've got a quest, so, question. Well, here. Your question wasn't from a lawyer. I think it highlights an array of different ways that lawyers can contribute to this world from helping com companies grow to reducing conflict to um, regulation, um, all kind of terrific opportunities. Well, you sort of answered my question, but let me ask it um, more specifically. Where you both work with lots of lawyers doing lots of different kinds of things, where do you think the most interesting legal work is? That is, 
you know, should a, um, a young, really smart student go in-house to one of the alternative protein companies? Should they go to the FDA or the USDA or to one of the firms that's representing some of the um, uh, companies trying to get approval? I mean, where's the most interesting, impactful work? Um, you know, it's probably, there's probably a lot of lawyers needed to draft a contracts to rent spaces for the, the labs, but, but that's not probably exactly what is exciting um, our students. So what have you seen in terms of the most exciting, impactful legal work? And, uh, and what would you suggest someone takes a look at? Press you or me. But well, for both uh, of you, anyone who has an idea, what do you suggest? You go first, Max, and then I'll, I'll check it. So my answer is, um, it depends, but I'm going to tell you what I think it depends on. I think it depends on where you have passion mm -hmm. and where you could sustain your goodness. Okay, so um, when I think about this world, you know, I, I, I was just stunned by the speakers over the last few days and sort of the length to which um, these professionals were willing to sacrifice for multi year long battles to get changes done or to, um, as, our, as a speaker on um, Wednesday talked about, you have to be willing to sort of live with the suffering of it more directly. Well, honestly, I wish I had that, those skills, but I don't. And, and I think I, I'm not a lawyer, but I can contribute on the, on the plant-based investing side and I can hopefully help make that world work a little bit better um, rather than just being concerned about my own investments per se. So I think that it's great to connect who you are with where you could have the most impact and what will sustain you for multiple years. So to go with highest impact and be burnt out in a year okay, um, might miss the point, but other people might just be inspired by the same thing that would burn out somebody else. Um, you know. I, I'm, I'm obsessed with this topic of, of uh, plant-based against plant-based suing each other. And coming, I've been on the executive committee of the program on negotiations at the Harvard Law School for over 20 years. And to see that kind of waste because of a failed negotiation process really kind of frustrates me. I think that that's a fascinating opportunity, but I certainly wouldn't want to claim that that's more interesting or more important than changing the laws that, that Chris was talking about a few minutes ago. Oh, I've got a, my favorite example of that is a sure. Sony Betamax, where you, Sony realized that they were on both sides of that lawsuit, both as a maker of the VCRs and, and the content providers as well. Um, we've got two good questions from our audience. Okay, For, no, Chris, Chris, go ahead. you want to jump in or you want to go to another question? Um, I, I would just say, you know, I think you answered it perfectly. I, I, I think that this is an industry about goodness and passion, like you said. And, and I just look at Kristen and, and Chris, um, um, uh, they could be really doing anything um, uh, and, and paid uh, in a very different way, but they've decided that their payment will be the people that they inspire and the change that they create. Uh, and when we taught the class a couple of weeks ago at, at HBS, you know, something that really struck a lot of the panelists and also me was, the success of the industry is really on the back of people like Chris and Kristen and the people at GFI um, uh, and Dipti Kulkarni uh, um, at Sidley Austin who are doing a lot of selfless work to create that legal pathway such that these products can be a success. And, and if you wanna have a lot of impact, you, if you could be one of the people that have crafted the legislation or the lawsuit that makes this industry a success, you know, that lasts forever, uh, uh, much more so than someone who has jumped on that pathway. So, so I think the role for lawyers here is, is critical and particularly someone who has the wherewithal and, and, and the passion for it uh, to, to see it through, so. Thank you, Bryce. Uh, we have a couple of good questions in the audience, but unfortunately we have a class coming in here. So uh, I will, I will, they are two of our former students. So I have uh, copied these questions and I will uh, send them to you directly in case you'd like to, to answer them. So I have a 15 minute walk, but when I get home, I'll, 
I'll attend to that. Can you read them, Chris? Can you yeah, I'll just say them out loud real quick. Uh, first is from, uh, from one of our former students, Amy Chow. She says, when you're evaluating potential investments, are you focused primarily on companies that develop products targeted omnivores or flexitarians? And does that ever clash with marketing towards vegans? Uh, another question from Harish Vanuri, another one of our former students. Uh, he says, do you see investment opportunity in the plant-based tools companies are, that are upstream of consumer products? For example, uh, companies that are logging the plant and fungal kingdom genomes or using AI to understand protein structure and unlock new functional proteins from plants. Um, yes. Yes. Okay, great. Well, with